So as we continue on this from this morning's text, we know that where we finished off in verse 47, I think the last thing we read was verse 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Jesus cried out, it is finished. And we talked about how he received the vinegar, where he didn't receive it when it, the first time it was offered to him with the myrrh to help him with his, what he was going through. He wanted to feel the full effects of the pain and suffering. But now we see that he accepts this, this drink, a second drink that he's offered. He, he accepts it. We talked about the picture that it portrays. This drink was popular during that time. Jesus accepted it because of two important images. <clears throat> the, the drink was given on a stalk of a hyssop plant. And being that these events occurred during the time of Passover, there was an important picture that we could see. During the, during the feast of Passover, a hyssop was used to apply the blood of the Passover lamb to the wooden doorposts of the Jews. It is interesting that the end of this hyssop stalk pointed to the, the blood of the perfect lamb, which was applied to the wooden cross for the salvation of all mankind. Also, the drink was a product of fermentation, which is made from grape juice and yeast. The word liter literally means that which is soured and is related to the Hebrew term for that which is leavened, yeast, or leaven. It is a biblical symbol of sin. When Jesus took this drink, it is thus symbolic of his taking the sins of the world into his body. So verse 47. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly, this was a righteous man. Now this centurion probably was involved with many, many crucifixions. But he knew that this crucifixion was very different than any he had ever seen. And so he knew that Jesus was not just like any other person that was crucified. And he said, surely this is a righteous man. And the, the sun that went, the sun was darkened. They had three hours of darkness. Imagine that right in the middle of the day that the sun would be darkened. And then there was an earthquake. And then the rocks rent. And the temple, the veil of the temple was rent. The temple veil was 18 inches thick, like I'd mentioned, 30 feet high. For that veil to be ripped from the top to the bottom would have been impossible. Now, you, you could imagine if somebody cut the bottom of it and you had a bunch of people pulling one direction and a bunch of people pulling in the other direction, they could have ripped it from bottom to top. But for that veil to be 30 feet high and that thick, for it to be, ri to, for it to be ripped would have been a very difficult thing. But God ripped it. So the veil is ripped. Imagine that would have freaked out the priests. <clears throat> what was behind that veil? was the Ark of the Covenant. And I'm sure they all knew what happened in um, the Old Testament at Beshemesh when they opened up that Ark. And maybe some of them saw the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> you and I all know you do not open the Ark. But... The only time someone would go into that room, the Holy of Holies, was once a year, and it was only the high priest. Only one person, only once a year, and he would only do it one time in his life. And, I mean, if he messed up, that was been it, right? And so he would go into that, actually it was the burning of the incense that would only do once in his life. But the high priest would go into the, the Holy of Holies, and he would offer the blood of the sacro, the the, the the goat that was sacrificed, there was a scapegoat, and then there was a goat that was sacrificed. And the blood of that goat was placed on the mercy seat in, in seven places. 
And when God would look down upon the violated law, he'd see it through the blood of that, that uh, of the sacrifice, and the children of Israel would be forgiven for that year. Only once a year he would go inside of there. Now the vent is open. The, I mean, the, the veil of the temple is rent. And now there's open access. That means that anyone could go in there at any time, anywhere. The Bible says we could boldly approach his throne to find grace to help in a time of need. And we could go to the Holy of Holies because of the blood of Christ that was shed for the sins of the world. So now this, our sin is not just covered for that year. It is removed. And now there is open access to God. And that's what that veil had pictured, that there's boundaries. There's a barrier. You can't get in there. That was a dilemma that, man, that mankind faced. That mankind, who is a sinner, is separated from God from, the, from Genesis uh, chapter 3. When Adam and Eve used to walk with God in the garden in the cool of the day and they had fellowship with him after sin, after they sinned, they were removed from the garden and mankind was in a dilemma that he could not approach a holy God because of his sin. And so then even when, when God gave them the commandments, they knew they could not keep the commandments, so he gave them the book of Leviticus and how a sinful person is to approach a holy God. He has to do it through the priesthood, a mediator, and there's a tabernacle, and there's a veil, and there's all of this ritual that he has to go through that he has to have a sacrifice a substitute the innocent for the guilty you have to have sacrifices and offerings and all of this in order for a sinful person to approach a holy god and even at that point it was very limited in the relationship that your common everyday ordinary man had with the lord himself because you had to you had to have that relationship through the priesthood and the priest had to come to the lord with a sacrifice but now all of that is done away with the renting of the veil. Now there is open access because of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. So the centurion says to himself, he testifies, surely this is a righteous man. Then it says in verse 48, And all the people that came together to that site, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. And all his acquaintance and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off beholding these things. And so the people that left there, many were sad at what had happened. They were probably so traumatized and so upset at seeing that, what had happened. They forgot the message. They forgot what he said. What did he say? That he's going... He, he told them that he's going to suffer many things and that he is going to be killed and then he is going to rise again. But because of what they were going through, they were so upset. They probably all just forgot about what he said. You know, sometimes we can be going through some things that we can be so upset, we can be so down that we, we can tend to forget what he said. He said, I'm coming back for you. Well, you're, he, he told us that where I am, there you will be also. He told us, I'll never leave, you, leave thee nor forsake thee. I promise you eternal life. But sometimes because we go through difficulties or trials, we forget. We can tend to forget who we are in Christ. And that's what happened. They forgot. They went home. And the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off beholding these things. And behold, there was a man named Joseph a counselor, and he was a good man and a just. So he was a good, just man, a member of the Sanhedrin, Joseph of Arimathea. And he was, he was not one that consented to the death of Jesus Christ. He was one that opposed that. The Bible says he was a good man, and maybe he was a secret disciple. Maybe he wanted to be a public disciple, but he just wasn't sure if how it was going to go over with his colleagues, his friends, with the position that he held at the Sanhedrin, and he probably didn't want to speak out for Jesus. And maybe it was hard just for him to not consent, and maybe he got questioned at that. But he was a follower of Jesus, but he kind of maybe just um, was a little quiet about it, more so than he should have been. 
Kind of reminds you of a man named Nicodemus, who was also a follower of Jesus in a quiet and a secretive way. You know the Lord is not going to let you to, to be that to be a secret uh, believer for very long. Christianity is not meant to be uh, secret or private. That's what the world wants. Keep it to yourself, right? But that but the Bible says, "Let the redeemed of the Lord what say so." That we're supposed to speak out. So here you have here you have Joseph of Arimathea and a man named Nicodemus who kind of they were followers of Jesus, but they were a little bit apprehensive in letting it be known publicly. Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews, and that's why he comes to Jesus by night, because he doesn't want anybody to know that he's coming to Jesus. Remember um, John chapter 3, that he came to Jesus by night? So we see now Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Look at um, John 19, verse 39. Or verse 38, John 19, verse 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. So after Jesus went through what he went through, here you have Joseph of Arimathea. He believed in Jesus. He was a follower of Jesus, but he didn't want anybody to know. He finally says, I don't care what people think. After he's seen what Jesus went through, he says, They're gonna, they, they may despise me. They may not be my friends anymore. They might unfriend me in, on Facebook, but I'm still, I'm going to go to the body. I'm going to go to where Jesus is. And in another, and another person, verse 39, there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night. Secret disciple. And brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes and about an hundred pound weight. They Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new sepulcher wherein was never man yet laid. Then laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews, preparation day for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. The sepulcher was near. When you go to Israel, there's a place called the garden tomb. That's where some people say that Jesus was crucified. And there's, that's where you have that mountainside. It's just a little hill, actually. I don't know, 20, 30 feet high, maybe. And it looks kind of like a skull. You can kind of see the eyes and the nose. And maybe when years ago, it was, you know, because things erode, that it was even more pronounced, looked like a, a skull. Or maybe it was called the place of a skull because that's where people were crucified. But that place, that garden tomb, if he was crucified on that, on that mountain, that little hill, then it's right where a garden is. And the place has been a garden for a long time. So some people think that that's the place where Jesus was uh, crucified and that that tomb there called the garden tomb because there's tombs there and that's where jesus was buried it makes to me it makes sense and when you go there it's the only place you'll go to in israel for the most part where there's a christian influence because everything you're at you're at synagogues i mean you have the jews and all the you know they go go through all their religious um repetitious prayers and all their rituals and everything. That, I mean, it's just all over. You see this all the time. And then you have the, the Muslims and you have the um, e Eastern Orthodox and the Catholic. And you have all of this going on. And you see very little Christianity going on. In fact, I remember when we were there on Sunday, we didn't go to church. It wasn't like you said, okay, where's the nearest church? There wasn't any that we knew of. There, it's not like they're going to be in a phone book. And it's illegal to proselytize. It's highly illegal because they don't want one group trying to recruit from the other group and then having all these, these battles and wars and all. It's just very, uh, a lot of tension when it comes to that. So we had our own, you know, with the group we were with, you know, we had devotions, Bible studies, and, you know, we, we worshiped together. 
uh, before the in the mornings and, and uh, did things like that. But we didn't have like a formal uh, place that we went to church when we were there. But when you go to the garden tomb, it is just Christianity is everywhere. You have groups come there and they'll bring their, the church groups, choirs, and you'll see you have different areas of the garden where people will where people will be singing, different groups, can't, different languages, and they're singing the hymns that we know. And they're singing it with different languages, and it's super, very beautiful. There's times where I'd leave our group and go just to sit and listen to them. One time I think I recorded the whole thing was so beautiful, but I forgot to press record. I remember doing that. I've done that so many times, like on Jesse's birthday. I was, I was holding the thing. I was, oh, I was getting so much good footage, and then look, zero, 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 zero. I think you gotta press it twice. I think I don't know. I was, or you missed the, the button or something, iPhone. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> but I remember um, going to these different groups and and it's so beautiful. And you just feel the presence of the Lord there. When you walk into the garden tomb, you feel the presence of the Lord. Now there's another place where they say that Jesus was buried, where he was crucified and where he where he was buried, his tomb. When you go there, you feel like you're in. Satan's lair. <laughs> so I was thinking, man, if just you go by your senses, you know it would have to be the garden tomb. But we cannot always trust our senses, and because there's such so much uh, disagreement, we don't know for sure. But we do know that he died, he was buried, and he rose again. And we know that the tomb he was in, he wasn't in there for very long. <laughs> he just borrowed it for a short time period. But the one in the garden tomb, the reason why our, the archaeologist, we went with this last one, and he was a an archaeologist, and he did a lot of digs, and he was very, a very educated person. He said that he felt like it was an other original one, the one that's I describe as Satan's lair. In fact, the second time I went to Israel, me and Pastor Paul, we didn't even go. We stayed outside. We didn't even go in. That's how evil it felt. We didn't even want to go in there. It's weird. I videoed a lot of it, too. You see just all these gothic-looking, it just was... And you got a guy that's guarding the gate. He's all dressed in black. And we had our phones out. He says, you got to put your phone away. So we put our phone away, but we still videoed it just because he told us that. (laughs) (laughs) But um, it just was not a friendly place. But the garden tube hall, it was just Christians all from, you don't even, can't even talk to each other because everyone speaks different languages. But you can feel each other's uh, spirit. It's an awesome thing to go to the garden tube. So I think it would probably be there. But our archaeologist felt like it wasn't that one because he said that the tomb, the date on that tomb, the way that the tomb is dated, it was too old. It wasn't dated uh, the the time frame or something. So he said it couldn't have been this tomb. But I don't know. Maybe it's not even any of those two and it's somewhere else. But anyway. So, but the way it describes it here, you know, it, it was close by the garden near the place it was crucified. I don't know of any garden at that Satan's lair, that, that other place. It's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. That's where they say that the other site is. Anyway, so here you have these two secret followers of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who probably, you know, he, he agreed with what Jesus was saying. He could see the miracles that Jesus was doing. He even said, no man can do these miracles except God be with them. But because he was so pressured from, his, from, from the fellow uh, Jewish religious leaders that he did not want to make it known that he believed in Jesus. Or maybe he didn't come to a point where he actually received Jesus or committed himself and became an actual true believer, a true follower. And same with Joseph of Arimathea being part of the Sanhedrin. But there came a time when they witnessed the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and they said after they seen what he did, they said, we don't care. That was enough. And what did they do? They went to the body. What's the body of Christ? The church. How do you know someone is a follower of Jesus? Because they go to church. They go to the body. When people say that, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I just don't like to go to church. That's an oxymoron. That's a contradiction. You're telling me that when, when Jesus tells Peter upon this rock, I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
When Jesus Christ says, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and he gave himself for it. When Jesus says that the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth, you're trying to tell me that it's not important enough for someone to go to the body? They went to the body. People are saying, why are you going to the body? It's dead. Why are you going to church? It's dead. Why are you going to go to church? You're going to get sick. Why are you going to go to church? They're not following all of the mandates. Nobody's following all the mandates, by the way. Not even the governor. Follow him around. I was following him around the other day. His mask was, he was under, underneath his nose. Nah, just joking. <laughs> just. I don't want some NSA start to... I'm not following the governor around. I'm just joking. Just trying to make a point. <laughs> anyway, people that are believers think much of the body. That's what happens to Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. He says, you know what? If I go, people are going to, man, I'm going to lose friends. I'm, I, I may lose my position on the Sanhedrin. I may not be able to be a teacher anymore. People, or maybe no one's going to listen to me anymore. Maybe I'm going to experience persecution. I don't know. But still, I'm going to the body because I've seen what Jesus did for me. If you and I understand what Jesus did for us, then we will go to the body and, we'll, and we will sacrifice and do all that we can for the body of Christ. And that's what? That's the church. We will serve Jesus Christ through the church, the local New Testament church. It's not something, you know, people say that, you know what, uh, religion, that there's so much um, hypocrisy. There's so much people that are fake. I said, yeah, same is true for 24-hour fitness. Same true for, for um, I don't know, what, Whole Foods or you go to, an, you go to a, a, a health food place. There's people there that they might be buying health food, but they, they're also eating hot food Sundays. There's hypocrites everywhere that doesn't stop us from doing anything but going to church. Same with the mandates. It doesn't stop people from working their jobs sometimes, but those same people won't come to church. Something doesn't add up. When you and I love the body, we go to it. When you and I love Jesus Christ, we go to his body. This is the body of Christ. We ought to be fellowshipping. We ought to be serving. We ought to be sacrificing. We ought to be giving for the cause of Christ. What else did he start when he was on this earth? He instituted the church. How dare someone say that it's not important? Or how dare someone say that you and I shouldn't even be here because of a mandate? We ought, to obey, we ought to obey God rather than men. There have been people and missionaries have sacrificed their life to worship. There have been missionaries that we have supported that sacrificed just to go to church. And they have to go to an underground church. All of their church, all of their Christian life, they go to an underground church fearing the government will find them out and arrest them. And they still go. And people are afraid of a little virus that they're never going to get. They might get the flu. They might even get the COVID. But so what? I'd rather be faithful to the Lord and get the COVID and trust that he's going to heal me. This is just my opinion. If You know, if I say just my opinion, you can't be offended at me. <laughs> okay? Just my opinion. So, I may be wrong. But I know this, that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they were not committed but when they seen, I mean, did you hear as we went through chapter 23 what Jesus did on the cross? And the Bible was very, I mean, if you and I were writing it, we'd put all the gory details about what had happened, right? And you, it's just glossed over other than you and I research and know what the crucifixion was like. And what I was reading was basically uh, from people that have investigated and, and dug into it. And I was just reading their quotes of, of how they described the crucifixion. And it just says in the Bible, and he was crucified. 
But all what he did, all what he sacrificed, all what he went through, and I tell you what, Christianity, for the most part, has gotten soft and lazy. And people are content. This is just my opinion. People have been lazy and content with staying home and watching things on a TV. And half the time, if I don't know if they're watching it or not, maybe praise the Lord if they are. I'm glad. And some people are sick. Hey, like I said, it's just my opinion. I don't know everything, right? I don't know who's, who's doing what and why. And really, it's not between me and... I'm just wanting to basically preventative maintenance that you and I need to be committed no matter what anybody else does. And if you've heard stories of missionaries and things that people had to go through and had to plant their churches and sometimes were threatened at gunpoint, I have missionary friends that were, had guns pointed at them when their children was around and they continued on serving the Lord. I tell you what, hey, you know back then in the Roman days when the Christians were being tossed to the lions, those Roman emperors... Man, if they just would have known, all they had to do was get out a little virus. They could have stopped Christianity. If they just would have known that. They told, man, we're throwing them to the lions. All we had to do is just tell them they're going to get sick. I'm just being sarcastic. <laughs> Isn't it amazing, though? And then you got brothers and sisters fighting with each other. So what I'm saying to you, I'm not saying that we should go out there and cause dissension. But I'm saying we need to be committed no matter what anybody does or what anybody thinks, whether it be the governor or whether it be our own family. We need to be committed to the things of God, and we need to be committed to the body, the body of Christ. I'm not saying that just because I'm a pastor of this church. This goes for Christians of all churches and all local churches, everywhere that, that, that people are worshiping, that we need, to make, we need to make it a big deal. And if you make it a big deal, your family will be blessed. Your family will be blessed. If we are committed to the, the things of God and if we are committed to his body. That's what Joseph of Arimathea is all about. He said, you know what? I'm, I, don't have, I don't know much maybe about everything about Jesus. I know this, what he went through. I'm committed to him and what I have is his. And what do I have? I have a tomb. They didn't have much time to bury Jesus. Remember, if he was crucified and he died at 3 o'clock, they had to put him into the tomb before 6 o'clock or before the sun went down and three stars, they could, and they were able to see three stars in the, in the night sky because that meant is the next day. And the next day was a day of the preparation. And that's the day that, that um, and during that, or this is the time of the preparation. You're going to have the time, uh, time of the Sabbath. They were not able to do any of this. So Joseph of Arimathea says, you know what? I have a tomb. Let's put him in my tomb. And he gave it up for Jesus Christ. Jesus is not going to need it that long. And he may not have uh, understood everything, but he knew this, that the body of Jesus is precious. Oh, but it's, it's dead. It's a dead body. The church is dead. The church is dangerous. The church is boring. The church is not important. The church is irrelevant. Just put it on a TV screen. The TV screen is not church. We said that for years until now. You kind of just watch church on tv that's not church and then now it is i don't know what what changed you can't fellowship with the brethren that way so the the body is they just kept you know what they did they made a big thing about the body of jesus christ that's what joseph of Arimathea did and they said you know what okay maybe it is dead maybe the body of jesus is dead but we are going to do what we can to liven it up make it smell better we're going to anoint the body we're going to allow our spiritual gifts and our fragrances to, to, to wake up the believers, I guess you could say, spiritually. To use our gifts and abilities to sing, to, to preach, to teach, to help out, to pick up people, to invite people, to disciple people. So that, they're, so that you, you can get a church that may be dead to liven up. And they went there and they anointed the body of Jesus. They used their gifts and abilities, both Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. And they went there. And it says in verse 50, And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor. He was a good man and a just. The same had not consented to the counsel and deed of them. He didn't give, he did not consent to what they were trying to do. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, a Jewish city, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. This man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Hey, he could have he gotten in trouble. By going to, to Pilate and asking him this, his, his uh, um, 
colleagues and his friends and his co-workers could have, could have been upset at what he was doing. What are you doing? He didn't care already. He said, enough is enough. And he baked the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone. He was very wealthy, and this was a very expensive tomb that was hewn out, hewn in stone, wherein never man was laid. It was a new tomb, and that, w- and that day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew on. And the women also which came with him from Galilee followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. And perhaps the women could see what he was doing and how important the body was to him. And so the body was important to them. And what did the women do on the, on the next day when they went to the, the tomb? What were they doing? They were going to the body. They were discouraged. They did not believe that, Jesus was, that he was raised from the dead. But what did they know to do? Go to the body. Just go to the body of Christ. You might wake up one day and you might, you might be dis- depressed and discouraged. You might not know what to do. You might feel like you just don't believe anymore. What do you do? Go to the body. You might have strayed off. You might have been living in fear. There are people, I'm telling you, there's Christians, and I've talked to them. I've talked to other pastors, and, I, and, I talk, and, and, they, and we kind of sh- share uh, uh, insight on, on what's going on right now and how to handle things. Not, we don't always agree on everything about how to handle everything. Uh, I don't think anybody really does. Sometimes I don't agree with myself. But, but we, do, we, do, we talk, and you know what, what's happening is a lot of Christians out there are, being, are depressed. Why? They're not going to the body. So what should they do? Go to the body. I would rather, I would rather have the possibility of catching the virus than being depressed. And trust the Lord that he's going to keep me healthy. I mean, I want to go down swinging, don't you? You want to go down swinging? I just want to sit on the sideline. I never did one. I wasn't that great of an athlete. Never was that tall. Never was that fast. I just tell people, you know, I'm not that, I'm not that strong, but I'm not that fast either. <laughs> you know, I usually say I'm not that, I'm not that strong, but I'm fast. I'm not that strong, but I'm not that fast either. And I never did like when I wasn't able to participate. In Christianity, I think sometimes, if we're not careful, we'll become Christians that don't want to participate. We just want to kind of lurk in the shadows. You ever play on on a team, and then your team won? You're trying to think about how did you contribute? How did I contribute to the victory? And if you couldn't come up with an answer, even though you won, you felt kind of bummed? Well, in Christianity, I mean, don't, don't you and I want to contribute to the cause? And so that's why we need, to, we need to make sure that we are doing our part to liven up the body. You ever, you ever hear someone say, church is boring. We're livening it up. <laughs> I was just dead. Well, what are you doing when you go there? Are you sleeping? Wake, it's live, help, you know, wake people up, man. Liven it up. The preaching is dead. Maybe you're just not focusing. Maybe you're just not paying attention. I don't know. And the women also which came with them from Galilee followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. And when they go to the tomb... When they, when they go there in the morning of the resurrection, they're going to go to the body of Christ. They're going to be afraid. They're going to be worried. They're not even going to, in fact, they're not even, they're not even going to consider the things that could have happened. You remember that story? They're thinking, who's going to roll away the stone? They weren't thinking about the fact that the, that the tomb was sealed and that there were, there were Rome, uh, Roman security guards there, Roman soldiers guarding the tomb. They weren't thinking of all those things. You know, if you and I want to be worried, there's lots of things we could be worried about over just the virus. There's a lot of things we could be worried about. Why stop at that? Why not just add in, what if you got cancer? What if you're going to get into an accident? There's a lot of people get into accidents. Why not add that? 
What if you're going to have an aneurysm in your brain and your brain expo- explodes? You know, what if, you're gonna, what if a tree is going to fall in your car and smash you? I don't know. What if you're going to be driving along the side of the river and your car gets a flat tire and veers off into the ocean and you drown? I mean, if we're going to worry, why don't we? There's like, what? In, there's an infinite things to worry about. <laughs> there's so many things they could have worried about, but they were worried about the fact that there is a stone there. And the one thing that they were worried about wasn't even an issue. Right? They get there and it's not, it's, the stone is rolled away. Wow, we was worried about that and it's rolled away. Yeah, we were worrying for nothing. Isn't that what's happening in Christianity? People are worrying for nothing. You know what worry does? Nothing. It doesn't help. Hey, be smart. No, I'm not trying to tell anybody not to be smart. Be clean. Be if you're sick, stay home. Don't, ha- don't hang around sick people. But worrying increase- it makes your, your uh, what's that called? Your um, defense, your immune system. It makes it worse. It weakens it. But when we trust in the Lord and we don't live in fear and we continue to worship, I think when you worship Jesus, you, your immunity level, I can't prove this, but when you worship the Lord, your immunity level is raised up. That's just my opinion. <laughs> this is a very opinionated service message. Okay? So if you don't agree with me, it's okay. We can agree to disagree. So then you can't hate me. <laughs> so he went to the, the body. He desired the body. That's the problem, I think, why a lot of people don't go to church. They don't desire, they don't want to. You and, I, you and I normally do what we want to do and what we need to do. And you know what? I need to be here. I want to be here. Amen. You and I do what you need and want to do. That is a fact. That's not my opinion. That's a fact. Or is that my opinion? I'm not sure sometimes what's a fact and what's an opinion. Okay. But I know this, that Joseph of Arimathea, he desired the body. He went to, to Pilate and he begged. That's like the, a teenager or a young person and wants to go to church and the parent says, no, you can't. I go, please, please, I want to go, please. When was the last time we had that happen? Please. Sometimes people will beg to do something. I want to go to a movie. No, I don't want you to go. Please. When was the last time we begged to go? See, that's what Joseph, he begged the body. He's like, God, I go to church. I want the body of Jesus. He sacrificed. He gave up his new tomb. Do you know why sometimes we don't think much of churches? We're not sacrificing much for the body. What do you got to sacrifice? Your time. Saturday prayer meeting, sacrifice. Sacrifice. Time, talents, treasures. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be. When you and I invest in, in uh, spiritual things, then that's where our, that's where our treasure is. You know why some people will do so many other things and it's totally fine? And, you, and they have reasons why, though. They have reasons why. But you know what the reason is? They want to do that. They need to do it. They want to do it. That's it. They need to do it. They want to do it. And when our need and our want and our desires for the body, that's when you know you're in a good spot spiritually. Joseph of Arimathea was in a good spot. They said, the Bible says he was a good man. He was a just man. Why? He wanted, he desired the body. He sacrificed for the body. He risked his position for the body. And he took care of the body. Are you taking care of the body? Well, I don't know how I can take care of the body. Mow the grass. Have you seen anything that was out of place today at at the church where we come together to worship? If your answer is yes, take part in, in being part of the solution, not... Part of the problem. Part of the problem is complaining. Part of the solution is doing something about it. And he took care of the body. What can I do? What needs to be done? Where could I fit in? Could I be an usher? Could I get involved with the choir when we, when we start to do that again? Could I help with music? Am I musically inclined? Can I help with Sunday school? Can I help with cleaning things up? Can I clean the yard? Can I set up before church is finished? Can I clean up afterwards? Or should the same people just do everything and get so much blessings that they're going to explode of blessings? 
We don't, you know, there's some people in here, I don't want to see them explode of, with too much blessings inside. We've got to share it so everyone gets the same, same you know, everybody gets a perfect amount. Find out how you can take care of the body. And then be a testimony for the next people that God's going to use to go to the body to anoint Jesus. And what's going to happen? They're going to find that he rose from the dead. And they're going to go there to anoint the dead body, and they're going to find out it's full of life. It's not dead. This church is not dead. And if you're in a dead church, go to a church that's alive, if that's the case. If it's the wrong type of church. Be careful I say that. Not that we're on the And so when we see what Jesus Christ did in his physical body, then you and I could be like Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus for Jesus' spiritual body. And that's the church. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? With heads bowed and eyes closed. Luke chapter 23 is a heavy chapter, like I had mentioned earlier, about the crucifixion. And we end and we see that all that's left after the crucifixion is the dead body of Jesus Christ. He died, he was buried, and he rose again. We will see that happen. 